Hey, welcome to Build Your SaaS. This is the behind the scenes story of building a web app in 2020, trying to show you what it's really like to do this. And uh, this week, I've got a great guest for you, Ian Landsman, who's been building software businesses since 2004 when he launched helpspot.com. And back then, that was installed on location software. And then five years ago, they released a SaaS version of that. So he's kind of done it all. He is full of wisdom and is also just entertaining to talk to you. I think you're going to enjoy it. Here's Ian and I talking business. One that pops in my head, I don't think I've ever told this story. Just like a long time ago. So I just launched HelpSpot. So this is like 2005. It was like right when I launched it. And I had been hanging out on like the Joel Spolsky, like Joel on forums, mm-hmm. Joel on software forums. Yeah. And so Joel, you know, I mean, now I'm like so old, like these are like old guys now. So I don't <laughs> know, people might not even know who these people are. But anyway, so Spolsky had his partner, Michael Pryor. And Michael invited me down to have dinner with them because they were in New York City. Yeah. And so I go have dinner and I'm like, these are my, these are my 37 signals. Like, this is it. Like Spolsky and prior mm-hmm. is unbelievable. Like inviting me to dinner. This is fantastic. So I go down there. I go to their offices. It's New York city. It's fancy. It's like, I mean, their offices weren't super fancy at the time, but they were nicer than my office. Right. It's like a, yeah. it's a you know, nice office. And uh, my, Michael actually gave me this tip about how to handle your bank accounts, which I still use to this day. Like the whole thing is great. <laughs> and then we go to dinner, and it's just like the most obvious thing in the world that Spolsky has no interest in me at all and is super fucking pissed off that he's been required to go to this <laughs> dinner by Michael. So I had to sit through this extremely uncomfortable dinner with Spolsky like, can I get the fuck out of here? I went away from this dude. And so like, I was like, huh, there's like a dose of reality about like your heroes. And so, so then I was... Some, of, that, the, some of them start. aren't... What? I mean, who knows? He he could have had an off day or whatever. Sure, absolutely. But. Right. Uh, but so anyway, yeah. So then you're like, oh, these are just like real, like even if it's just an off day, right? Like, yeah, he he's just a normal person who either he's a normal person who's a jerk or he's a normal person who had a bad day and he's a totally nice person, whatever it is. But yeah. either way, he's just like a normal dude and there's not actually anything that special about him per se. Yes. Yeah, exactly. What what was the tip about bank accounts that you still use? Oh, so I had um we people wanted to buy with bank transfers, um, yes. Europeans especially and stuff, and I had no idea like even how to do them or what. And the thing with the bank transfer is like they can like there's nothing really stopping them from pulling the money the other direction. Like I guess it's theoretically there's not like really authentication on it. Like if you have the transfer information. You could at least in theory initiate a transfer out. I think now maybe there's some more controls on it, but okay. it was like a it was like a dangerous situation back in the day, especially for this like work. You know, it's a system built for like big institutions to transfer money that now like every random schmo is like, let me send you three grand on. And it didn't really have a lot of security around it, especially yeah. like 15 years ago. So I was asking him about this, and he said what they did was they have a second bank account. And as soon as they get transfers, they move the money like instantly to the other oh. bank account, which nobody has the transfer information. So they yeah. leave the transfer account empty, essentially. And that's we still good, basically do that. Like That's a total hacker move right there. Right. Like, <laughs> so what, what, I don't even know if it's still applicable anymore. But And a lot of SaaS apps don't do transfers anymore. Yeah. Um, we do. But. So, so you've been doing SaaS for 15 years? No, what not technically. Uh, HelpSpot was on premise, and then it only we sassified it five years ago. Okay, so you're still you're still like you're you're still pretty new to the SaaS game. Yeah, I mean this is I mean this was a decision. I, it's very it's sort of interesting, and like, I literally remember thinking about this because I was building HelpSpot, and I was like, should this be hosted like Basecamp is, like yeah. where I just put it on a server? Because Basecamp is like. like Six months before Help Spot or something. Yeah, and you're like, "Fuck those guys! I hate them." <laughs> Wasn't as passionate about them then, but uh, I was just like, you know, I don't know a damn thing about running a server, and like, I, I mean, we had a couple servers. Like, I 
physically owned servers that I sent to a co-location and they ran like the HelpSpot website and stuff. And I was like, I don't think like I'm capable of doing this. Like, cause yeah. you know, back then there was no web frameworks. There's no AWS. There's no nothing. Yeah. So it's like buy a bunch of servers and put them on a rack somewhere. Well, that's not, I don't know. Like, I don't know if I can do that. So I didn't do it. And then, so you always wonder like maybe HelpSpot would have been Zendesk. Like yeah. HelpSpot could have been Zendesk. But I, you know, I also think the more likely outcome is HelpSpot is nothing, and I just work somewhere because like I couldn't keep the servers running and the whole thing <laughs> loads. Like that's probably the real solution, the real result. But uh, yeah, yeah, because timing plays a big role in this, right? Like it's like some things just need to mature to a certain point before they're viable, and then it's like something kind of breaks free, and it's like, oh wow, like now. This is, and some of these things are thick, cyclical, right? It's like, I mean, people are still referencing Gail Goodman's um, talk from, you know, long, slow, sass ramp of death. But like, who talks about constant contact anymore? You know, like, I, and I, I mean, it's, it's still out there, but, you know, back then she was talking about email newsletter software and now you know, it, we got Substack. It's like a whole new generation, essentially the same thing with a little bit of extra sprinkled on top. But it's funny how, like to me, paid newsletters, the fact that that is a thing again. I remember Kevin Rose had a paid newsletter like a decade ago. You know, like it was a thing back then and it kind of petered out, wasn't really, you know, didn't really work. And now all of a sudden, it's a thing again. Or like Ning. Ning was a way to create your own social network forum. Remember that? And it just like petered out. And now we have this new generation of Circle and Playgroup and all these new like online community things. And sometimes the timing is just right. And, you know, and, and, you know, some things come in waves, right? Like, there are some bands that were popular in the 70s and then they had like a, a real kind of dark period through like the 80s and 90s and then 2000s, they pop back up and all of a sudden it's like people want to listen again, you know? Yeah. Yeah. yeah like uh, we, have, we, have, we even have that same exact thing with HelpSpot to some degree where it was like uh, HelpSpot, people were moving to HelpSpot when they were getting rid of like these really old client server type help desk applications and like super old school type stuff. And then, okay, so it's HelpSpot's on-premise. You put, download it and put it on your own servers, okay? Then like you have SaaS start to take off in like the late 2000s and Zendesk and all the other, you know, help desk apps, which are just SaaS only. And then it's like, oh my God, everybody's going to SaaS, right? Okay, so they're going to SaaS. But mm -hmm. then we had this whole other little round where people started to come back to the on-premise because like then they got worried about security of the SaaS. And then you had people like coming back to like, well, we were SaaS, but now we want to host ourselves again. Mm -hmm. And now it's kind of gone back the other way where most everybody is again choosing the SaaS version of HelpSpot now at this point. Um, yeah. But there are still some on-premise uh, new customers, I mean. But yeah, like even within just this one industry, there's been like this wave of like, oh, we're all going to the cloud. Oh, wait, some of us don't want to be on the cloud because we're like a hospital and like the cloud's kind of iffy and the security's not great and they don't have it all figured out. And now we're getting away from the cloud. And then now we're going back to the cloud because it's kind of more <laughs> figured out and yeah, stuff like that. So uh, yeah, it's kind of interesting to ride the wave for. It's, it's, it's all waves, man. It's all about catching waves. That's the, and then, I mean, this is the scary part for me is wondering how long is the wave going to last? Do you think? Do you think about that at all? Like, does that still worry you? It does worry me. Yeah, I mean, there's always like there's all the different types of waves. It's like I don't think anybody's going to stop answering email in my lifetime, so I'm not mm -hmm. like worried about do companies need to answer email because I think they will. But you know, like obviously, like somebody could come up with something. Like for a while, it's like, oh, is uh, is intercom like the only way anybody's going to do customer service? Like, is mm -hmm. it just going to be a widget in a web page, and that's going to mostly take over with emails like a distant second which it didn't and it hasn't like i mean i think it takes over a, very, a particular use case like if you have a pure SaaS app like intercom might be a better choice than pure email but that's like 
whatever was that 1%, less than 1% of all businesses or whatever, you know, everybody else is still dealing with email and forms on websites. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, you have like all that kind of stuff that goes. Do you think it's competition mostly for you? Cause that's what worries me. Like, competition for sure. Like Spotify petrifies me because I'm not, because I'm not naive. I know that for the user, uh, you know, most of them don't care about open, you know, open uh, protocols like RSS, most of them don't care. Like m- people will always find the cheapest, easiest thing that it gives them what they want. And so, if you know Apple Podcasts loses a ton of market share, and Spotify can offer a one-stop shop for creating a podcast, like recording it and then hosting it and then inserting ads into it and distributing it to millions of Spotify users, I can see that, yeah, objectively, podcasters just want to go where they they can accomplish all those things and um, and get their audio out or whatever the job to be done is, right? Yeah, I mean, I think that, well, part of the thing for me, the fear of that kind of thing is also just that as us, this is one of the real, I mean, the bootstrapper circles, we spent a lot of time primarily talking about the advantages of being small and things like that. Uh, Mm -hmm. But I think with this kind of thing we're talking about, it's one of the real disadvantages. It's just that when you have to move, like if the market moves a little bit and you have to move, like it's like when I started help spot, it's like, okay, then SAS became a thing like three or four years later, but it took me like four years after (laughs) that or five years to actually do it for us Mm -hmm. because Okay, once you have customers and they're paying you and they have demands and they want the thing you make right now, like there's just not a lot of time and money and resources and energy to move to where the market might want you to be, Mm -hmm. you know, or where the future is in that market, right? So it's like, you know, so we we hired somebody and they worked on it like this was like the guy's whole job for like a year was to do this thing and get us cloudified and stuff, and it's like. But that all had to happen. There had to be bandwidth to do that. You had to, you know, we took a couple detours down other paths, which probably would have been better spent just making help, you know, satisfied. So like mm-hmm. you have all these little things that even just one misstep for a bootstrapper takes like two years yeah. to recover from. It's not like a big company where it says, oh, I have two teams working simultaneously on different things, or we can just throw a bunch of money at this and recover quickly from our misstep. Like, Mm-hmm. You're just kind of so that's the part more. It's like oh, it's like the you might see something coming, like you know, even with what you're talking about, like okay, maybe you see Spotify. If you determine like Spotify is really a serious threat, like it's hard for you to move now that you have customers and they like mm-hmm. what you're offering and they don't want you to do something else or make these changes that you feel like you might have to make. And you you know, it's only the two of you guys. So how much time is there to make big changes and all those type of things start to yeah. factor in. So. So how how do you hedge your bets? I've never I haven't done a very good job of hedging the bets. I mean, we've, tried, we've, uh, we've tried building a couple of different products. None of them have been nearly as successful as HelpSpot. Um, so there's not a lot of hedging. I mean, the hedging is sort of like it's almost like where you have to bake in the hedging to having a good idea and being in the right market. Like that's the hedge. Like people are gonna have to always answer email. A mm-hmm. B like. Uh, for us, like it's on premise, and literally nobody makes on premise help desk software anymore. So there's like a subgroup of our customers that would that have a very limited pool of options uh, yeah. if they don't want to have it sassified, if they really mm-hmm. want to host their own help desk software. So that's a plus for us, right? So that's a some sub percentage of our customers. We if we lost everybody else to Zendesk and Help Scout and whatever else, like these half of our customers just wouldn't do that because they don't want that. Uh, yeah. So that's like part of the hedge. Um, we we don't lose all those customers to those other competitors right now, which is good. But, you know, if, you know, there's that aspect of it, the idea itself, like our interfaces, you know, I think you can have differences like that. Like, I think it's probably similar for you as well. Like 80% of what we provide is exactly the same as what everybody else provides. Like, I think it's a total 80-20 situation. Like if you go through all the help desk apps, they all do the same thing. If you go through all the podcast hosting apps, they all do the same thing. And then it's like, well, what's the 20% that you do that makes the interface different just so somebody understands it more and yours clicks more with a certain type of person than with somebody else? Or you have mm-hmm. that one weirdo niche feature, which is really useful for a certain group of people that 
some Spotify is not going to build because they don't, they only care about the huge numbers. They don't care about these 20,000 people who want this niche thing, which is a giant business to you and is completely irrelevant to them. Uh, you know, coming up with those little differences and then being able to explain that you have those differences is a whole nother challenge, but, uh, yeah, yeah those kind of things. Uh, this is completely unfair, but it, I think it could be kind of fun. Let's, let's prognosticate on how we think our friends should hedge their businesses. Oh, that, <laughs> there we go. I like this so, idea. Let's start with uh, Ben and Tuple. What do you think they should be doing to hedge their business? Yeah. See, I mean, so they're, so early that I guess I don't think that there's anything they could do. I feel like they just have to like keep moving forward on the path they're on. You know what I mean? Like they're doing well. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Like what could you like right now to try to like actively try to hedge it would seem like a bad idea just because yeah. what are they going to do? I mean, I guess the only thing I would say is could you, the most obvious thing to me would be, okay, you have this technology for like sharing these screens in a really cool, seamless manner. Like what are other markets that might use that other than, dev geeks and mm -hmm. then could you you know without too much work start to like approach that market for whatever i don't know mm -hmm. whatever gr other groups that might need that type of thing uh but yeah. then you could have like maybe it's a separately branded product but it's just the same infrastructure or whatever and gives you that hedge of like a second market besides devs in case github comes out with awesome you know, pair programming video tomorrow, and mm -hmm. then maybe you're in bad shape. Uh, you could have that hedge there. That would be yeah. like an obvious one. But something that doesn't take them too like I don't think that they would want to do like a whole new product. Like I think they'd want to do a whole new product in quotes where it's like the same product repackaged or something along those lines. Anyway, yeah. How, how much of hedging do you think is? Because there's different ways to hedge. Like, like Jason and David hedged their bets because they took money from Bezos. And ever since then, I think every, like every bootstrapper would take that deal. That's just an incredible deal. Like that to, <laughs> to, to be like, cause the, the, the fear for me is I'm now, I'm not getting that deal. And I'm, I mean, actually, if someone's out there right now and wants to give me that deal. <laughs> Yeah, same for me. If you're out there and you want to give me millions of dollars and never have any say and get like a tiny percentage of my company, then I am all for the deal. Come we'll get it. We'll do it. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> um, so the the fear, I wonder if you still have this fear too, is I haven't yet socked away enough money that I feel secure. And I mean, that's one way to hedge is if you can sock away a bunch of money, if you have a couple million dollars in a bank account, then that's your hedge right there is, yeah, when this runs out. But I'm still early enough that, you know, I, I, just, I just paid off my line of credit. I'm starting to save up money again. Like I spent all my money raising kids and starting businesses. So now I'm finally in one that makes something. And it's like, okay, and I'm 40. So I know like, okay, I got to, Got to pump up that retirement savings account. Got to do all that stuff. But there's always this feeling of, damn, I wish there was a way of like cheaply going public or if like I could actually crowdfund and actually pull in more than 100,000, like to, to actually be able to take some money out of this company because the cash flow is nice, but there's always the uncertainty yeah, I mean, you have like, I mean, one interesting thing Jordan Gall talked about in their podcast was like literally hedging in like the markets with like options and stuff. Like that's sort of an intriguing idea. I'd never heard anybody talk about at our sort of scale. I don't think he's actually even doing it, but just the idea of like, well, yeah, like if I bought options against like Zendesk, then yeah. like I would sort of like help desk software space, right? And yeah. like, from some massive downturn anyway, like in terms of the, the market as a whole, like obviously not for we yeah. do something wrong or HubSpot specifically, but that's sort of an interesting idea. Um, definitely you have the idea of like, you have a successful business now, like you could just sell it and lock in the money, right? Like you could mm -hmm. sell it, lock in whatever it's worth, right? You're a three, four, six X, whatever yeah. that you get. And since it's growing strong, you'll probably be at the higher end of that range and you sell it. And bam, like, then you build the next thing. Yeah. My only thing with that is that 
just for in my experience, which other people have done this successfully. I have not yet. It is a goal of mine to have a second really successful product mm-hmm. but at, at some point, but I have not. So that's always in the back of my head. Like, well, I have this really successful product. Like, oh, I could sell it, but then there's no guarantee that there's another really successful product on the other side of that. And the amount of money I would make from it is definitely not like I would feel totally comfortable not working for the rest of my life. Like, that's definitely, I would not feel that way for sure. So, mm-hmm. so then that's like, so then it's like, okay, I have this thing that regularly makes what anybody would consider a very good amount of money. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that that's not to be trifled with in terms of like, there are reasons to sell and everything, but that is valuable and also something that isn't necessarily repeatable. Um, yeah. So it's always on the back of my mind there is that, hey, like once you get to a certain point, it's like, yeah, this is, Maybe it's not always interesting because you've been doing it for a long time, or maybe it's the market gets a little scary or whatever, or mm-hmm. maybe it's going to go down for a year or two and things like that. That's not necessarily the end of the world. It could be, it could be worse. <laughs> you could well, sell your it, business and then not have enough money. 10 years from now, you're in a job like that you hate yeah. uh, because you sold your business that was doing just fine and maybe it wasn't optimal, but you were like, well, I'm just locking it in. But then there wasn't actually anything better on the other side of that. So yeah. And it's interesting that no matter who you are, well, maybe someone eventually gets out of this, but like like Adam Wavin still worries about whether he's going to be able to keep earning revenue off of the Tailwind ecosystem. And I look at him from the outside and I go, what, what are you talking about? <laughs> like that is, that is blowing up and you've got a healthy amount in your bank account. Like that is... But he worries about it too. And- well, this is something that is not, nobody talked about it when I was coming up and basically nobody even talks about it now, which is that when you have a like somewhat successful product and at least in the software space, I don't hear many people talk about it. It's like just the like whole like financial, uh, just smart financing of your personal finances when you like don't have that much money and then you come into more, you know, a good amount more money yeah. and you just spend right up to that good amount more money. <laughs> yeah. Like whether it's on the business, whether it's personally, whether it's you paid off this, you bought a new house, you yeah. got a kid in school, you got all this stuff. I'm in, I'm in this phase right now. I, ha- I have a kid in private school. I just bought a new car and we just bought a new house. <laughs> Yeah. So everybody spends to their means, like by a default, you know what I mean? And so uh, I think that there's not like the financial sort of literacy just in our society, right? Like that's what society is pushing you to do your whole life is like Mm -hmm. get a better job so you can buy more stuff and do more stuff and all this. Uh, Yeah. So it took me a while to kind of like, yeah, deal with that. Like, oh, maybe we shouldn't spend all the way to every dollar that we possibly could in some way or other. And Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think that there's just that, that, that is there. And then that worries there because you know, you're spending more Mm -hmm. even if like, yeah, he's doing very well. I'm, I'm sure he's not necessarily spending up to what he's bringing in at this moment, but you still know you're spending more than you used to. And, uh, you know, that worry is there that as that lifestyle creeps up like that. Yeah. uh, You know, if if it does go down a little bit, like, are you going to have to fire people? All those kind of things. Adam, I mean, this is the advantage of one-time sales is if you hit oil, if you hit a geyser, then you get all of the upfront value of that thing now, and you can sock it away. And this is like the, the, this idea of market and volume. Like Adam and I were selling the same thing. I had a course for developers, and he has a course for developers, but his did way better than mine. And the volume matters a lot in terms of even hitting uh, even hitting a level where you have enough margin in your life that, you know, just like having a bunch of money in a bank account is life-giving in of itself. And, I mean, I can see, like, in one-time sales, the worry is always, like, when is this going to die out. And there still seems to be lots of demand for things in the Tailwind ecosystem. I think, I mean, he seems to be hedging his bets the right way, which is 
similar to what Taylor Otwell did, did, is when you own the framework and you can invest in the framework better than the competition, so Adam's, Adam's competition is Bootstrap, if, you, if he's investing in Tailwind and building more cool stuff, cooler than Bootstrap is, and just keeps like doubling down on that, um, it's going to be pretty hard, I think, as long as it continues to evolve, you know, like... Well, that's where I always think uh, they, both Adam and Taylor are very similar to me to 37 Signals in that I don't necessarily find them to be very useful as examples for other people. Uh, now, in certain bits of their execution, they're extremely useful and you should absolutely mm-hmm. like copy what they're doing. But there's other parts where like, just like build a huge audience as like the first thing of advice to give somebody is just such a hard, like that's, it's, that's way harder than build a successful SaaS app. Like that's, that's mm-hmm. way harder to be like, I'm going to build something with a million people who want to follow me and participate in it. Like that's un, like, that's, I mean, HubSpot's had a couple thousand customers ever. So like yeah. go build <laughs> something that has millions of people interested in what you're doing is such an incredibly tall order uh, that, and not even something they necessarily set out explicitly to do. You know, it's like a whole yeah. thing that's like, so yes, like once you have a million people, you have a so much, fun. that's like having a big bank account full of money because I could find stuff to sell to this million people, even if yeah. only a tiny percentage of them want to buy it. Like that's a, a huge, huge, unbelievable advantage. And now they have to still do a good job, which all three of those people have done of picking the right products like picking products that work for those markets. Like that's, they could have picked terrible products and they would have made less money. They would have still sold a good amount, but they would have made less money. So I think they're all really talented and have done a great job of those things. But as like advice for somebody who wants to get into software, I don't know if it's it's not that useful to me to like build a a gigantic open source project that (laughs) everybody loves. Like that's like, okay, there's 10 of them on earth. Uh, yeah. You know, we happen to know three of them personally. Okay, great. <laughs> like, I don't know, like how you do what you're going to go get glean out of that for the other millions of people out there who want to run the software companies. But yeah, I mean, I think one thing is it does help to be in motion in the right areas, you know, like, uh, and I think people can seek some of that out. It's like b- just being in motion, doing stuff, swimming in the right waters, you know, that that does help. And I've said a long time, like the developer market is unlike any other market ever. Like you couldn't even replicate that success in an adjacent market. Like there's nothing, like there's no um, group that is that, that uniform, that accessible online, that incentivized financially, individually and corporately to level themselves up there's just like nothing really like that. And so... Are sort of unique, yeah. To even bring that many people on board that, that they can build these open source products that have a million people interested in them so quickly. I mean, in just yeah. a few years it, with no money, no marketing, no anything. And just because the developer community can just spread an idea so quickly is... And I'm not really one for selling stuff to developers in general. Like, I don't think that they're a especially good market overall, but... really. But yeah, but when you get the right uh, when you get at them in the right angle, then they're obviously an amazing market. See, Ian, I think you need to revise this belief. I think you've got a holdover from the old the old crusty days. Yeah, it could yeah. be. It could be because it changed. I I I mean, podcasters used to be a terrible market. They were like DIYers in their basement, wouldn't pay for a thing, and then the tide changed, and I felt it. And that was one of the reasons I was even interested in going after it. Cause I was like, okay, wait, stuff is, this is changing now. But I think develop like right now, I, if I had a fund, I would be investing in developer tools, developer frameworks, even what a young guy like Caleb Porzio has been able to do on his own getting up to, I, I mean, he's making six figures on GitHub sponsors. Right. Like, but it, but isn't that showing? But see, that's my point, right? Like, so he's got, which is amazing. I love this GitHub sponsor is something that I've talked about forever. Like, when Taylor first worked at Userscape, like, we talked about things like this. And there was some other things like it, like Git Tip or something was one, but it just never, 
GitHub doing it has made it all work seamlessly, which is what needed to happen. Um, but like he couldn't sell any of that software. He couldn't yeah. sell it for money. Like, yeah. It has to be this indirect, right? And how many people are going to be able to do that indirect? For every Caleb, there's probably a zillion people making $5 on their GitHub repo, right? So I, yes. I don't know. Yeah, but, the, but this, is, this is the thing about examples is people all like i i give examples all the time to prove my theories <laughs> and then people say well those people are exceptional and i say yeah anybody who succeeds in business is exceptional i think like the the fact how many people have tried to build help software over the years like you are sure it's it's you better chances than winning the lottery better chances than you being a star football player, but it's still, you are one out of maybe, I mean, we don't even know, like, cause we just don't know. Yeah. Of people who've tried, there's people trying right now. There's people who have a target on your back right now that are hunting Not you. my back, but yeah, they're <laughs> hunting other people, but yeah, they might catch me in the crossfire. <laughs> to me, even watching Caleb was interesting because I'm not technical enough to know if he's a good programmer or not or whatever. I saw him early on record a video about Livewire, and I already felt like this guy's going to be a success. I, I don't know technically how good it is, but his enthusiasm, his being like passionate about it, you can just already kind of tell. It's like, you know, and I shared it, I, I shared it with Adam, and he's like, yeah, that seems kind of interesting. And I'm like, no, I, and now, it's kind of come to fruition, you know, like you could, the, the, you have to be exceptional. And so part of the, the, um, idea is like, okay, well, how do you get exceptional? And it's just like, you got to put in the repetitions. You got like, how are you going to get better at surfing? Well, you got to get in the water every day and that's how it works. There's also, I think, a, a unique thread through all of these people. I mean, ab absolutely DHH, but also Taylor, Adam, and Caleb is they're all extremely talented. And that's going to be hard for you to replicate in terms of advice, like be super smart, right? Not whatever. I can't do anything without mm -hmm. advice. But yeah. what you can take from them is what they all do extremely well. And exactly what you're talking about is share their ideas and 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 implement their ideas in a way that is accessible. So like it's Caleb making a video that's interesting. So mm -hmm. when you watch it, you watch the whole thing and learn what the hell he's trying to get you to use. Or yeah. like in Taylor's very early days of Laravel, like he had just amazing documentation for this little fr unknown framework from some guy in Arkansas. Yeah. But like the documentation was amazing. Like that's when I reached out to him was after I read the Laravel documentation. I was like, this is like, this is exactly what I want. And I knew it was what I wanted because I, I understood that it was like clearly written. You could see I had everything you wanted. Like, so whereas, you know, if we're talking about software developers in particular here, like everybody wants to code the thing. But yeah. then what happens after you code the thing is what makes you into Taylor or DHH, like great documentation getting on videos and podcasts and whatever to express your ideas like yeah. and market essentially marketing yes well even like ruby on rails is a great brand it's just a great brand it 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 it's like i you instantly get what this thing is it's like it's like, like if you were trying to explain it to somebody you were like well there's programming languages but this kind of like puts it on the rails. Like it makes, helps you move faster and there's constraints within it, but it just helps you build what you want to build faster and you can kind of feel it already. So yeah, I, yeah, I think that's a good, uh, and that's something anybody point. can do. Like if I build something, get out there and tell and write concisely about it and document it fully. And those are things that you could just do. You don't even have to be that smart to do those things, right? That, but you have to have the will to do them as opposed to like go in and add a feature mm -hmm. like that's right. And a lot of people want to go add that feature and, I, and listen, I'm a guy who wants to go add the feature. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, well, yeah. I want to just build the, so I like building software. I like the creativity of it. I like being in there thinking deeply about the problems. I have very little interest in marketing in r updating the website and writing documentation I am totally one of those people. So I, uh, this, my story is a little more about timing. Like there wasn't like not a lot of competition for what we had when I started. 
Like now we have a domain that's 15 years old that ranks for good terms, at least mm-hmm. reasonably. So like we can like we could be doing a lot better if I was interested in marketing, but I'm not that interested in marketing. So, yeah. you know, we do fine and well enough for me and I'm happy with it, but there's no doubt we could be five times bigger if I was more marketing oriented. But uh, yeah, so I mean, I, so you're taking advice from somebody who knows <laughs> I, I'm totally not like those guys. Like I'm yeah. not like Adam. I'm not doing a million screencasts about Tailwind and all the awesome stuff you can do. Like I'm not, mm-hmm. I'm not that guy. Uh, yeah. But you should probably aim to be that guy because that guy is the guy who gets out there and gets mindshare. Yes, I mean if that's if that's you, yeah. I mean my what helped me after years of trying to do stuff on my own and being convinced that I would just have to be, you know, uh, somebody who could do it all. And Justin, you got to teach yourself how to actual, actually program something because, you know, it, you're never going to make it, was teaming up with somebody who's just amazing at those things. Like, I've had other partnerships in the past and they didn't feel like this. There's a lot more risk. Like, it's like being married to someone. It could go, it could go shitty any day. <laughs> but that feeling of being like teaming up with somebody and just their efforts multiplying your efforts and your efforts multiplying their efforts that I've never felt anything like this before in my life. Like it is uh, incredible. And I meet a lot of developers now. I really wanted to get talked to you about, um, uh, about how software is all about volume. We might have to save this for like another episode. Um, there's a lot of like really talented people I look at that are building stuff and I go, man, like if you teamed up with someone like me, that would be a business. And now I just, now that I've felt it before, like, it's just like, I can see how I could augment other folks. And I think, I don't know, like it actually makes me wonder something I've been throwing around the idea. This is going to sound terrible. If if you really are someone who judges me, just stop listening. <laughs> I don't think it's really terrible, but I, like thinking about like team sports and their draft, you know, I sometimes wonder if there's like an equivalent of draft in tech where so like you and I have, now we have some time and we have some money. How can we get some young talent in our draft that have the potential um, and, you know, like the, the biggest obstacle in anybody's career or definitely starting a business is that you're going to, you're going to go broke or you're going to get broken. Right. And I don't know, there's just something about this idea of like, I wonder if, cause now I'm trying to think of how am I going to invest my money? And to me, there's just, Nothing compares to investing in tech products that, like, like Transistor is my best investment by far. Like, doesn't even compare. Like, you know, like maybe if I put 5000 into Apple like 10 years ago, but like that. So I just keep thinking about that is there's all this talent and I wonder if there's a way of investing in that now in the same way that a sports team says, okay, rookie, we're going to, we're going to, you know, put you on, I don't know. I don't know what it looks like. It's still hard for tech talent to connect with technical marketing talent. Like that's, you just have to, like the worlds aren't really have a lot of touch points. And so you end up with a lot of like developers looking for technical marketing type people. And then you have, technical marketing type people who are stuck working in some big company because they Mm -hmm. don't know any like developers to like start a software company with or whatever. And uh, so there is something there about like if there, if it was easier somehow to make those connections, it certainly being interesting. And I'm not, I've never been a big one on partnerships, but only because I think they're at a lot of risk to me. Um, But there's no doubt that when you have a good partnership, it's way better. Like a good partnership is way, way better than being on your own. It's not even close. Um, 
So if you can find the right person, then that's just amazing. So yeah. finding the right person is so hard and people end up like, it's like a marriage. Like, well, I just settled for this rando because I needed <laughs> a programmer. And now like, lo and behold, a year later, the rando sucks. And this, my great idea, which might be a very good idea, is now like ruined because I'm in I'm married to this rando. I, and I'm in bed so with the rando. That's the thing. Right, I'm in bed with a <laughs> rando. And so that's like a really risky proposition. Uh, but uh, yeah, if, if it's a good combination, then obviously it's a multi, huge multiplier over trying to do stuff yourself. Well, this is definitely like if you see what, like what Adam did with Steve was interesting because Adam was already having success, but it was almost like he drafted Steve. Like he saw st something in Steve that made him say, this is worth partnering up with. Steve had like, no Twitter followers. Like there was like, and then there was, but there was the potential. And I wonder if there's a way to, to scale that. I guess this is kind of what like investors do and VCs do and accelerators is there, they think they've got the ability to recognize talent and invest in it before, you know, somebody else discovers it. Yeah, I do think that's where, like, you see, you know, software companies by, being started by the same people over and over. Because the, once you get in that pool, well, now you do have access to people making connections for you and, hey, you should meet this person. And there is that whole buddy system that I think really helps. Um, yeah, like, stuff like... Uh, I think, you know, as somebody who's looked at a lot of resumes over the years, I think the issue is, like, there's... In terms of what you're talking about with, like, some type of business idea like that is that... There's a lot of just randos. Out. Like everybody's going to say, yeah, I want to be a part of that. But like, who's actually the cream of that crop on both sides of that? And like, that's a huge talent right there. Like distilling that down. Yeah. Like, and then you need the, okay, then you have your two groups and you try to put them together. Um, and then, then you have all those just interpersonal, does this work interpersonally and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Have you invested in any companies? Yeah, I've done, I haven't done too much. Um, like really like uh sort of well i guess let's see what i've done i probably invested in like six companies or something overall so far most of them have been duds one of them is one of them is going okay i don't know if it's gonna, we're gonna make me any money one of them is calm which is like that meditation app which is oh yeah i put like a thousand dollars into that and i don't know the last st statement they sent me was like it's worth like one hundred and forty thousand dollars or something wow. like that but i don't know but i haven't gotten any, i've gotten like four thousand dollars in cash from it so we'll yeah. see if i ever make any actual money but yeah, the other stuff just went to nothing. Like I did like one with the person I knew, one with um with Stu on like Angel List, one of which is like still around, two of which are gone, just nothing. Mm -hmm. Buff buffer. I invested a few bucks in buffer, which is still around, but I don't think like at the point I invested in it, like I don't think it's actually any more valuable than that. So I don't think it's really worth anything. Uh yeah. So a few things here and there, but I never put a lot of energy into it. So it was kind of Mis yeah. misguided i think in general i mean i think it's safer to like my only big investment right now is cloudflare like i think that's like i think that's really i think like this is a huge advantage people have and if you work in tech is like you know the awesome tech startups even mm -hmm. after they go public like you still have a huge advantage like the rest of the market has no idea how amazing cloudflare is yeah. so but you know how amazing cloudflare is yeah so you could still get in on a much less risky basis than risk than you know, an angel list or some guy, you know, who needs 10 grand, like mm -hmm. investing in public company Cloudflare is a thousand times less risky. And you have an extreme knowledge advantage over the average investor in this yeah. particular area. So I think there is a lot of value in technologists just focusing on like, who are the new public companies or the up and coming companies that I know, I use, I know people who use it. We're all excited about it in the geekosphere because we all communicate so quickly mm -hmm. and that information doesn't make it out to the rest of the world for another year or two. So now I have this asymmetric advantage there, even with a public company, uh, as opposed to like the riskier kind of startup scene and all that. But yeah, it is fun. I mean, I like the idea of investing in startups. Like I would certainly like, if I ever sold for enough money to do that, like I would love to just like meet with, founders and of course that's like a dream job i would totally love to do it but yeah yeah if you're if you're bankrolled for it i think it's it's good but exactly well this is fun man i i uh 
I'm going to, I think I'm going to publish this on the Build Your SaaS feed, but I think we should do another one and talk about why software is all about volume. Cause that was like what I had in my head, but we got to, we got to do a follow up. So everybody, you got to follow, you got to follow Uncle Ian Landsman on Twitter. Ian Landsman is his Twitter handle. And yeah, go check out Userscape, HelpSpot, Laravel Jobs. Laracon online. Look at you. You're running all sorts of you've hedged your bets. Yeah, I mean, we got some stuff. Definitely like Lara Jobs has done really well. And we run the Laravel conferences, which do well. So I mean, yeah, I'm not gonna starve or anything here. Hope you enjoyed that chat with Ian. Definitely going to have him back to talk about a bunch of other stuff. Right now, I want to thank our Patreon supporters. Take it EV podcast, Ethan Gunderson, Sophia Quintero Diogo. Chris Willow, Mason Hensley, Borea Soler, Ward Sandler, Eric Lima, James Sowers, Travis Fisher, <laughs> Matt Buckley, Russell Brown, Evandro Sassy, Preduma, Schembecker, Noah Prales, Robert Simplicio, Colin Gray, Josh Smith, Ivan Kirkovic, Brian Ray, Shane Smith, Austin Loveless, Simon Bennett, Michael Sitford, Paul Jarvis, and Jack Ellis, Dan Buddha. Darby Frey, Samori Augusto, Dave Young, Brad from Canada, Canada, <laughs> Brad from Canada, Sammy Schuchert, Mike Walker, Adam Duvander, Dave Junta, and Kyle Fox at GetRewardful.com. 